I am honored to be with Joel Trustee, the co-owner and president of Trustee Cook in Indianapolis. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me, Noah. Yeah, this, this is great. Uh, I met Joel a long time ago. Um, he's had a relationship with today's machining world in the past. And um, as we've been talking about this season, um, we've been discussing companies that have a product. And Trusty Cook has several products. And um, so we thought that this was a really important person to talk to. So first of all, Joel, um, I want to get the five minute version of Trusty Cook, what you guys make, and then um, the story of the company as well. And then we'll work into some other topics. Sure, sure. <clears throat> so my, uh, my dad uh, was designing ship to shore missiles for the military. And he got tired of that and spun off a small company doing custom electronic projects. And they hired a guy by the name of Cook. And Mr. Cook went to Chrysler and Chrysler needed some uh, wear pads for lack of a better term for an assembly line. And they needed to be out of urethane. So he brought back a purchase order to my dad for 3000 of these widgets that my dad didn't even manufacture. So he had to get a, he bought a used pizza oven and bought a book on polyurethane and they figured out how to hand batch this material and to fill the order. Well, two years after that, he came up and invented the dead blow hammer. And that's one of the products that we make today. So explain the dead blow hammer. What, okay. what so exactly it, is this? All right, well, I'll show you one. So it's, it's made out of polyurethane and it's got steel shot in the head that moves from one end to the other. It gives you extra power when you hit and it doesn't, damage what you're hitting and it doesn't bounce or you don't get that vibration through your elbow. So they started this company and they were new to the market. So it was very expensive. Uh, it was hard to get in the market and they had a house brand named CompoCast. They had um, landed a deal with Madco tools. They landed a deal with Cornwell tools and they landed a whale of account named Snap-on. Well then, oh, wow. yeah. Well, then Stanley Tools came along and Stanley said, hey, we want a private brand as well. And they put the brakes on that thought and bought the whole company. So they bought out my dad in 1982 when I was studying down at Indiana University. And they wanted to... Who, three who bought the company? Stanley. Stanley bought it. Lock, stock, and barrel. And so Stanley was private branding for Snap-on and all these companies that they were competing with. In the meantime, about mid eighties, there was a recession and they wanted to move the hammer plant down under roof with a screwdriver plant. So they asked my dad if he would help them do that. And part of the trade off for doing that was they gave my dad back commercial ground. They gave him two product lines that they didn't want anymore. And my dad and older brother helped him move the plant down to Sherall, South Carolina. Mm. So, so we built my dad and brother started trusty cook in the mid eighties. And within by 1990, the non-compete ran out on the hammers. So we started Trusty Cook brand so we could sell to the government. And we also landed a private brand named S-Swing out of Rockford, Illinois. So as soon as we, we had to retool the whole factory, and as soon as we had excess capacity, I reached out to Matco and said, hey, we're back in the business. We'd love to brand for you. Or do you prefer to buy from your competitor, Stanley? So they came back on board. Cornwell came back on board. We do all the sledgehammers for Snap-on. We've created a brand for Napa now. And so kind of our, our claim to fame is we private brand for most of the professional grade companies in the U.S. So before we go any further, I just want people to understand exactly how these, these hammers are used. Some of the the purposes of it. I've seen it in Graf Pinkert's shop if we're ever delicately uh, working with a machine tool to something needs to be hammered into place and you know like the the alternative way to do it where is where you have a lead hammer 
um, you know, it's got a lid on top, so it sort of softens the blow. But this is um, this polyurethane. It kind of softens things when you're hammering something in. Would you say that's a really good description, or yeah, I, I think a, it's a lot of other a lot of other things it's used for as well, yeah, right? A lot of other things, but the premise was it was made to replace lead and brass hammers. So it's it's made to not spark. It's made to not damage what you're hitting. Mm -hmm. um, the market to begin with was mainly mechanics. Anybody with a roll around toolbox that was working on a car or working on a machine tool would have a variety, a couple of these hammers in there uh, to persuade items without damaging what they were hitting. So if I you're going to hit something that's got a spline surface, this won't damage the splines. I see. And I think you had said how it happened, but say again, what, what inspired your father um, and or Mr. Cook to come up with this invention? Well, what inspired him was the durability of the material. This polyurethane, if, um, when you find the right application for it, um, it's a material that is very long lasting. The tear and tensile properties is incredible. It's very cut resistant. And it proved out to be the perfect material to build a hammer out of. But how did he, did one day it hit him? Like, oh, I mean, what was he exactly doing that, that made him come up with this idea? No, I mean, there I, must be some great lore. I've never been asked that question. All I know is my dad was very smart. And he was very creative, and he had numerous inventions, a lot of which he never took credit for. Um, I know he was a contract gunslinger, and he had not not gunslinger. But <laughs> that sounds that sounds much cooler than some <laughs> other. Well, I know I know this that a restaurant hired him to figure out how to cook a hamburger fast, and this was before um, this was before microwaves, and so. It was called Burger Chef. They're since out of business, but you, you might not even remember that name. Big competitor with McDonald's back in the day. And he figured out how to cook and mass produce cooked hamburgers in under six seconds. Whoa. Yeah, he built this. They basically electrocuted them. Now, he said they didn't taste good. And by the time you had to put so much seasoning on there, they were pretty much not edible. And I he kind of laughed and I said, you get paid? He goes, of course I got paid. So... He also worked on the first blood machine to analyze kidneys, and I think it was for Monsanto, and it's still in use today. And did you ever talk to him, say, Dad, what is your secret to coming up with all these interesting ideas? Well, not really, because it just seems second nature. I mean, my brother, myself, we, we do it all the time. Very now, I don't know what, you know, the, why, the, why the hammer, um, maybe he was also thinking about the free energy that you get. This is the inside of one of the hammers that when that shot goes from one end to the other, I think that was coming into play a lot with it. So it maybe was, it was a combination of multiple thoughts coming together. Very interesting. Okay. So he came up with the hammer and then, um, this was how long ago? It was in the 70s, maybe late 60s. Yeah, it took a long time. It took a very long time to grow that market because it was expensive. I mean, we don't charge a whole lot more today than they were, you know, 30 years ago. Interesting. How much is uh, a polyurethane hammer? And they come in well, different sizes? Yeah, we're up to we're up to 29 different, I call it a rock on a stick. Yeah, we're up to 29 different hammers now. So I'd Whoa. say, the, I would say the average is probably 50 bucks. Okay. And how do you make them and where do you make them? We make them all here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, we make the inside, the skeleton, the canister, if you will, all the steel components. We purchase the steel. We weld on the tabs. These are engine freeze plugs. Matter of fact, I'm the, the only person that buys more freeze plugs than, around here is Jasper engines that rebuilds um, engines, remanufactures motors. So we do the inside of the canister uh, right here in the plant. 
the, the actual polyurethane, it flows through our machine about the consistency of a hot syrup, a thick syrup, if you will. It goes into the mold. Um, it starts setting up. The chemical reaction starts immediately. We have 90% resin, 1% curative, our color, 9% curative. It comes through a series of zenith pumps. Um, once it hits that mixer head and it touches each other, the reaction starts. And within two minutes, it's, if you had it in a cup, you would not be able to pour it out. Wow. Within, within 15 minutes, you're able to demold the part and the part goes uh, in an oven, cures overnight. And the next day we have to hand trim every hammer and we hand brush it. So they're all handmade. There's absolutely zero automation. Whoa. Wow. Um, and, and then you have a few other products, the product that we know um, well, and I think it's pretty relevant to our listeners is the spindle liners also made of the same material. Yeah. We're not a one-stop shop. So we have, we have one material. It's a 95 a durometer. And if we find a product that performs well with our material, then we chase that market. So how did you, you, this is something, when did you come up with the spindle liner? So this, this goes into say a multi, a multi spindle and then, so the bars don't bounce around too much, correct? Yeah. So one of the product lines that Stanley had given back to my dad was called a hush tube and a mm. hush tube goes on the, it's on the outboard part of a multi spindle screw machine. And we make reduction liners that go uh, in a hush tube. Well, the hush tube is made to design to cut down on the, the noise and to control the bar width. Well, it's kind of a natural progression as multi spindles kind of went into CNC's because nobody has a million part run anymore. So in a CNC, you can do a changeover and be, you know, doing a different part, you know, in 20 minutes. We had a customer that called us from uh, Bestlock in, uh, here in Indianapolis. And the guy said, hey, Joel, could you build me a spindle liner out of your material? And I said, if I knew what a spindle liner was, I think I could. So he described it. And uh, we talked about it. He's like, hey, would you like to see a machine? I said, you did a great job of explaining it. We're going to reduce an inside diameter. We need to be 48 inches long. We kind of talked about what the ideal clearance would be on the ID. Uh, of the draw tube, what our ideal clearance might be over the bar stock, how we're going to fashion or bolt it to the actuator and all that. So I never even saw a machine and we built him eight spindle liners for his Mazak and talked to him a few months later. And he said, that's the best money this company's ever spent. Interesting. So this is, this was for a bar loader for, for like a horizontal machining center or vertical machining center. It was, it was for a Mazak um, CNC lathe. At okay. A three, yeah, three inch capacity. And he wanted to run smaller stock sizes. So we needed to reduce that inside diameter so we wouldn't fight the bar width. I see. So would this be like instead of a, a channel or this would go inside a channel? This goes inside the spindle. So it's going to reduce the ID of the right. spindle. If a guy's not running to full capacity, say he's going to run a one inch bar and his machine could process three inch, then he needs to choke that ID down. And so, right. yeah, so our liner goes in and it reduces to the desired inside diameter for that bar stock. Sure. Is this now the, you know, the industry standard or you, I mean, I know that there's springs. That's another thing people use. Mm -hmm. Um, what are what is this is this the thing if you have uh, a magazine bar loader well no I, I, this would be more for a cnc that's using a short bar feeder oh okay like a six footer yeah six to four to six foot correct okay what about like a 12 well if it, it could be um, I think anytime you need to reduce the ID of the spindle, then our liner sh could be used and should be used. But so is it to just to reduce the, the diameter or is it also just so the bar doesn't knock around? 
or is well, it both? It's going to do the same thing. So we're, we're taking up airspace. We are fill, filling the desired air void to choke down the inside diameter for your bar stock. And, you know, when we started, it was, um, <clears throat> I think in the industry, the typical delivery might have been three weeks if you knew somebody. Well, we're doing, all of a sudden, we're doing a couple a day, a few a day. Then we had to come up with a numbering system because we're doing 30 a day, then 40 a day. And then we started coming up with really kind of better ideas on how to do it. We're creating, we can create an inside diameter to uh, irregular shape. Say a consumer is bar feeding some irregular shape. What started it was hex and rectangle. Well, mm -hmm. we can build the inside diameter in that shape, rectangle or hex. We've also done a uh, inside diameter smaller than a millimeter, which you cannot do a lot of this stuff out of steel. So we kind of went after anything that the customer asked for. I've had a guy ask, hey, what's the smallest inside diameter you can do? I'm like, well, I don't know the answer to that. What inside diameter do you want? He's like, a millimeter? I'm like, oh. Uh, we'll and, figure it out. So we and did. do you sell this? Do you sell this direct? We sell through distribution and we sell direct. Okay. Yeah. What and what yeah. percentage would you sell direct versus distribution for this? I would say probably eighty percent direct. Okay. So unlike the hammers, this is this is a much more direct thing. It is, and the reason mm -hmm. it is, and I, it, it was really hard to figure out the market. So we started thinking that um, the machine manufacturers themselves would embrace this because it's needed, right? Come to find out, it's a necessary, it's a necessary evil. It, it's a few hundred dollar accessory that's going on a $150,000 machine that nobody wants to mess with. So I did the same approach that my dad had done with these hammers, and that was to get the end users using them the end users up on the mountaintops, you know, um, singing the praises of the product, and that would get the attention later on of the OEM guys. Well, it's still a necessary, it's a necessary evil. It's a product that really nobody wants to mess with. It's a custom part. Uh, it's got to fit exactly. The end user, you know, uh, it has to be right. Why and do you say it's an evil? Because it's a, it's an inexpensive component to a very expensive operation. And for, if you are the dealer for, let's say Akuma or, or Herco or Mazak or name them all, you know, they want to sell equipment. They want to sell the high ticket items. And then they, they've come to find out that we're steady enough and solid enough that they just tell, call Trusty Cook Direct. They'll get it right. They have the database. They know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll just step aside. And that's kind of the way it's worked. But it's grown. It has grown to the point to where we now have a, uh, you call us by 11. You can pay an expedite fee or a fast pass, if you will. And your spindle liner will be on the UPS truck at 4 o'clock the same day. Wow, which is super important for these people because, you know, every uh, every day, every shift is huge. You know what? You might, you know, when you're, somebody's going to build a widget for somebody and, you know, they're going to quote it. And there's a lot of things that have to take place before that gets to the customer. Well, there's an engineer, there's somebody along that way that has to order the raw goods. They have to order the spindle liner in this case. And then they go into production. Well, they, they, and they have to order all the cutting inserts, all the tooling that they need. Well, what we found out is there's a lot of opportunities along those ways for somebody to drop the ball. So, you know, our phone rings really, there's not a day that there's not some kind of a heat case where it's, it's an emergency. Yes. Yes. Well, we, now, Hey, this is, this is crazy. We even red label dead blow hammers every day because somebody forgot to order a hammer that they need. Who can have a hammer emergency? That's insane. So what would somebody in, in a typical shop be using one of these hammers for? Everything but driving a nail. Yeah. Is yeah, it often used by people who, who 
who were abusive toward the machine and don't, don't, don't know what the hell to do, so they just bang it because they don't want to. They don't want to do something correctly. Well, I don't know. The shortcut. <laughs> I think there's a lot of times when people um, red label a product because you know they just they just didn't get it done. You know, mm -hmm. some of the hammers go to municipalities where they're you know in fire. Uh, fire stations where these guys are training for this thing called this on combat challenge that the guy that developed this is uh it's turned into a thing it's even on espn so when you see that it's a it's a it's a, a competition and it's global it's called on target challenge and there's a section of it where they're taking a red dead blow hammer and the fireman has to move this chunk of iron six feet on a sled so they basically have have created a competition that just destroys these hammers interesting and interesting. we provide the hammers beautiful right um so this brings us to something um i really see as important to you you've told me uh, before that it's super important and that's listening to the customer uh you need to improve you need an innovation you're you're looking for something better to sell and the customer what you hear from the customer that is very significant for you correct i i think it's been the number one i mean the one of the reasons that we've been successful so mm -hmm. we've, we've established the you know listening and working with a guy that wanted us to try something different, different application for our material. Happy to do it. Um, we get a phone call every once in a while um, from different mechanics. There's guys that are on this uh, garage journal forum, 240,000 um, tool junkies that like to bounce ideas off each other. Mm -hmm. And the, the one guy said, Hey, <clears throat> is, can you make a, can you make a ball peen hammer that is, have a shorter handle for tight workspaces. I'm like, that's a good idea. So we came up with this incredibly large headed ball peen hammer with a short handle for tight spaces. Mm -hmm. And this is um, a very well balanced hammer, but what it, what it led to was a skew number. So we've created a new rock on a stick. Well, then a guy asked in the same forum, he's like, Joel, he goes, what's the, what's the ball peen in for? And I said, I was under the impression it was for, you know, for rivets and, you know, when they used to pound out rivets. And he's like, well, I never used this end. So can you make a, a flat end? I'm like, well, yeah. So that led to, so this was called Project Stubby. Okay. Simple concept right? Stubby led to stubby flat flat, where both of the ends now are flat. Okay. Okay. So with a little bit of machining work, we traditionally had forever four different size ball peen hammers. Stubby made number five. So now you have five ball peen hammers. And then if you add a flat to all those sizes, now you have 10. We went from four ball pe different ball peen hammers that has satisfied the market forever, right? Mm -hmm. it just had, it's proved out and it's worked out fine. So now we've got five with stubby. We got six with, with stubby flat flat. And then we did the flats on the other size hammers. So we went from four to 10 skew numbers. So wait, stubby is the, your, that's the name of that model. Well, we always name them in the house, right? This is Stubby and then Stubby Flat Flat. And then that led to Stubby's cousin. So Stubby's cousin's a hybrid hammer that's got urethane on one end. You know, it's just kind of goofy enough that, that people want to have one. But so we got, now we got 10 ball peen hammers. We actually have six new models. So I took that to Madco. So we have six new ball peens models. Well, they mm -hmm. put it on in three different colors. That's 18 more SKU numbers. Cornwall does it in 
two different colors. So that's 12 more SKU numbers. So listening to one customer, all of a sudden that added 36 SKU numbers. And it, do you, does that bug you to have 36 SKU numbers? Would, no. would you prefer if it was more simple? No, 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 no. It is simple. As once we establish the, the model number or the part number, say for, for Matco or Cornwell, well, then their purchasing can send an order in a trusty cook and my guys know what to make for them. I see. So we're utilizing all the foot soldiers from all these companies without having any foot soldier, any, we don't have any outside salespeople here. We just strategically part with these other companies and we, we make a good product, we hold our prices and we make delivery. It's that simple. Interesting. Um, so back to the listening to the customers, I just want to make sure I understood the whole process. So the first thing that happened was, in this case, um, you were monitoring a forum, and yeah. and then after you then after you were monitoring the forum, you communicated with one of the people on there, and that right. led to more. Yeah. So are you guys constantly monitoring forums like this? No, 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 no. There was some, there was a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace of who was making all these different dead blow brands. And we kind of stayed out of it because our balancing act is I, we have trusty cook brand that you have to have to sell to the government. And then we private brand for all these companies that we compete with. So, wait, 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 Go back up. I don't really know about the rules there. So yeah. you have to have your own private brand to sell to the government. Years ago you did, yes. I'm not and, sure what it is currently, but yeah, that's the only reason we created the Trusty Cook brand. I see. So it wasn't just that you wanted to do e-commerce and sell oh, direct. E commerce and, wasn't even a thing back then. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but now it is. It is. Now, yeah. So the back to the forum. So there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I rarely do, do get out of my lane at all, but I decided to Google something and it had, a, it had a lot of confusion on it. So I made a phone call or accepted a phone call. I can't remember how it went down. Had a real nice conversation. Well, this guy gets online and talks about how, you know, trusty cook, they're responsive. They're, you know, they're, yeah, they're, kind of the guys behind most of these brands and, and, you know, it, it kind of smoothed things over. So we don't monitor necessarily that, 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 um, forum, but mm -hmm. what we do is there's somebody either called in or asked about that. Um, we do every, when we come up, we call this a rock on a stick. When we come up with the new rock on a stick, we'll post something there. We'll ask for feedback. Sometimes now we've got relationships with a lot of these guys in this forum that will offer a limited edition. We don't charge a lot to get them out there to look in the hands of these users. So mm -hmm. they give them feedback. So right. now it's it turned turn into a relationship. It's not really that we're monitoring to pick out good ideas. We just kind of, we have a few that will reach out directly to us and, you know, ask a specific question. And we right. always, we always pay attention to what they ask. Very interesting. A lot of times we'll ask them, why do you ask? I'm like, you guys asking me about the, the peen on there, right? I'm mm -hmm. like, why are you asking about that? He goes, because I never use it. I go, so you want a flat on both ends is what you're saying. He goes, well, I guess that's what I'm saying. So I said, okay, we'll make you one. And did he, uh, did he explain why he needed it flat on both ends? Because he never used the ball end. Oh, so he's just saying, well, why not? Exactly. And I'm like, hey, I can't argue with you. You know, I'm, I don't want to argue with you. I'll build you what you want. Right. Yep. Is, is it sometimes though that, um, you know, people, people don't always know what they want. Um, are you sometimes, um, you sometimes feel like you're, you're in a vacuum or is that basically your main way of coming up w with improvements? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't say that a vacuum or anything that describes Do you do R&D yourself or is it? Yeah. Is yeah. it okay. Yeah, so some of the, some of the ideas that, that have come along are um, like my dad, 
my dad decided that he would do some testing and figure out, and this goes in a, in a wastewater treatment plant or a sewer. It's just, just a, it's called a grit collector. It's a wear product, okay? This stuff outlasts in that environment, hardened steel seven to one. Well, the wear shoes happen to be one of the products that Stanley had given back to my dad with the, with the hush tubes. So that kind of um, enabled my brother and dad to eke out a living long enough before the non-compete ran out. But some of the stuff that we do um, might not make sense. Like we had back when the, um, on Discovery Channel, the biker build off stuff started. All these guys building these $100,000, $80,000 choppers. Mm -hmm. It's an issue for a company named Thunder Cycle out of uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's mm -hmm. called uh, Eddie Trot is this guy's name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so Eddie's cutting these parts. He's cutting accessories. Not everybody can afford a $80,000 Harley, but people can afford to buy foot pegs, you know, for 300 bucks or products that he was kicking out on this Mazak. Well, he was having trouble holding tolerances on his Mazak. And I remember seeing an order come across and I'm like, hold on a second. I think that's the guy on Discovery Channel. I said, don't ever charge that guy any money anymore. So we sent him a whole bunch of spin aligners. I got a hold of him one day and I'm like, uh, I said, I need a favor. I said, we're going to put out, I think it was one of the pieces that we put in your magazine. And Eddie mm -hmm. Trotta was one of the first guys that he was in the magazine way he back. Did, he did a testimonial and he goes, Joel, I normally get paid 10, 10 grand to do this. But he said, you guys have been so awesome. I'm not going to charge it. I'm like, well, thank you. Right. So we ended up sending them a bunch of uh, trusty cook hammers. We got this great relationship going on and he calls back and he said, uh, Hey, could you do a dead blow bossing mallet? And I'm like, Eddie, what's a bossing mallet? He goes, well, it's a regular shape, you know, it's normally plastic with a wood handle and it's like, looks like a snow cone. And I go, what do you do with it? And he goes, we shake metal with it. Like you're pounding out a gas tank or a fender. I go, yeah, we can do that for you. We didn't charge him. We ended up creating three different bossing mallets. They're different shapes and you, depending on what it is that you're going to make out of them um, and how tight of bend you're going to do. Anyway, made them for him, sent him down there, didn't think anything about it. And uh, we were talking one time about something else. And uh, I go, hey, what, how those bossing mallets work out for you? He goes, it cut the work time in half. I'm like, no kidding. He said, oh, yeah, the lightweight plastic and a wood handle, you just got to be in there like a warrior to shape this metal. And so my older brother thought, well, this, you know, we're never going to sell very many of these hammers. We now ship these all over the world. Wow. Wow. And do you do much advertising? No. Um, I think the guy in the office that I think our spend per day is maybe 50 bucks on Google. Wow. Well, we may have to talk a little bit about that later. <laughs> yeah. well, back to, back to existing customers. Cause it's, yeah. we found it's, it's just so much easier, you know, we try to be real, real easy to do business with. Most of the, most of the, most of our biggest customers I've not even met. I mean, we've got some private brand hammer companies that spend 500 grand a year with me and I've never even met them face to face. And so we do, you know, if you tell me you're going to pay me in 30 days, okay, that's fine. Those, you know, set up terms. We don't go back checking any of that stuff, but so we be, we try to do, we try to be very easy to do business with. If we've got an existing relationship with a customer, you know, we always ask, is there anything more we can do? It's easier to get more business from an existing customer than to, you know, get a new customer. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a real good relationship with LNS, which is a short bar feeder company. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And long. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're great. Right. And, and the IMK guys are used to be edge technology in St. Louis. I'd say if you guys, if there's anything at all product wise that you think might perform better, if it's a wear item out of polyurethane, I'm not going to charge you. I'll help work, you know, I'll work with you and we'll see where it goes. Well, this, this is like a split block for uh, edge and it goes on a bar feeder and there's 70. Describe, describe it a little bit for the listeners. Well, 
you know what? I've never made a metal chip in my life. So I, I know that this goes in the end of the bar feeder uh -huh. and there's a pusher finger on it. And at the end of this long bar feeder, this thing has to separate and open up for that component to go through there. Well, I think they were sourcing these over overseas years ago. And I said, I can do that. We're, you know, we're one day away UPS, we're local. Um, and so we've been doing these for years for them. I ended up getting a call from LNS and LNS had a, uh, their bar channel or their, their bar feeder channels were with certain types of uh, coolant or, or lubricant were swelling up over time. And so now I now do all the channel sets for LNS. Wow. So you get feedback both from the end user and from the other people in on the food chain higher than the end user. You're feedback, both feedback is is uh is definitely our lifeblood. We listen to it, we work with it, and you know, because we've been able to respond and it's just worked out very well for us. I can tell. I can tell. Do you have any advice for somebody with a new type of product um that's uh they're just trying to get it out there and and then get feedback as well well i <laughs> i i would like to think that i'd have a much better answer than i'm going to give you but it seems to me that a lot of people thrive really thrive to perfect something before they want to test the market and i think you can spend a lot of time Mm. resources if you're not careful with that you know sometimes you so wait you're saying you're saying that some people take too long before they're ready to put something out there or are you saying people aren't prepared enough to put something out there i'm going to go with the first so i think a lot mm -hmm. of people will spend too much time in their mind they want to perfect it they want to perfect it perfect it perfect it and and i know that's a that's a too broad of a term but you know in reality they're afraid to go to market yes they're just dragging their feet oh no we got to do this we got to do that well you really got to test the sales into things to make sure that you're putting your energy and resources towards a product that is going to make it so i think you got to there's a fine balance in there right and unless you put it out there you're not going to have the feedback that you need not at all not at all. But if you've got a, if you have a small sample of trusted friends or people in an industry and you can say, Hey, this is what I'm working on. I'm going to send you some early versions of this stuff. I'm not even going to charge you. Well, you know, all this stuff costs money, but also sitting around on your hands, not going to markets costing you money, right? Yeah. You might use your window to launch something. Absolutely. Um, that is so astute. Um, before we end this, what's something interesting that you learned in the last week? You know, I, I, I think I've read about that this is a question that you always end with. <laughs> and, I forgot, and I forgot to give it any thought. That's all right. Interesting. That's better. Is it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Aside, aside from doing a Zoom call for the first time. That's right. Uh, now I know the, the value of a Zoom call because it's a lot more fun talking to you as I'm looking at you. Because it's been a number of years. IMTS got canceled this year, right? Yeah. So that was a big shot in the, in the side. All right. But you are learning things constantly. You're getting feedback from people. What, what else is something you learned? It doesn't matter if it's about uh, business or, or whatever. You could have been watching a sitcom and you got something from it. I, I don't know. No, oh, there you go. All right. Well, I, I do know that, I mean, this pandemic and the Rona has been hard on, on everybody, right? Hard on everybody for different reasons. Um, we've been very fortunate not to uh, business-wise be that, that affected by it. I mean, we, we did end up letting everybody know that you're gonna get 
paid if you if you were scared and you have anxiety about coming to work stay home if you need to help with e-learning stay home everybody's going to get paid no matter what we're going to get through this as a team and we did that but and and before this i mean my life has been you know i enjoy working i definitely enjoy working with creating something new working with customers uh taking a lot of pride in what we do and and i'd say this is one thing that i learned last week was that i had for the first time in a long time some kind of negative thoughts about work and i kind of backed up and i got back in my lane and i just all the side noise with the election and all this crazy stuff that's going you know on in the world is not stuff that i'm very good at separating and processing so mm. my goal what i learned last week is to just make sure you stay focused do what you like and make and and make sure that you are doing it all for the right reasons and that kind of for me gets me back in a zone awesome well uh yeah hopefully we can maybe now that it's over we can just focus a little bit more on other things i i agree i i try to tune out the news um yeah well so a little bit different wording it just had to remind myself to remember what what, what i truly enjoy and and make sure that that i get all the other side noise out of out of my out of my lane so i can get back to enjoying what i do so i i had a rough probably less than a half hour but it crept into my mind where I thought, oh man, this is, you know, this is a job. Well, it's not a job. It's my business. Fantastic. Thank you, Joel. Well, thank you.